Well, thank you very much. I uh, I came to UK. I'm really really grateful for the opportunity to 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 have gone to school here, mainly because it, you know I don't think I could afford to go to school anyplace else. Truthfully, my father was 18 when I was born, and uh, Dave Victor helped take care of my my mom and my dad and and whatnot. So uh, I finished college in three years and and started medical school when I was very young. Uh, we got married very young, just hillbilly kind of thing to do. And uh, for those of you who read Hillbilly Elegy, I, you know, that, 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 other than my fact my relatives didn't use bad language, that, that's uh, certainly my upbringing in my culture. And I came here with the notion I'd probably be an internist, you know, because I, I'd read this stuff about, you know, you solve all these medical mysteries, and I didn't realize it was all hypertension and diabetes and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, so, the word, God, I hate medical clinic. Lord God. But uh, I, I decided I needed a job uh, before I started medical school, so I came to work, I came down here looking for something, you know, maybe around the medical school, learn my way around, and ran into to a guy named Ben Rush and, and Ben Eisman. And it was very interesting. That, I had a tremendous, tremendous experience in, in doing that. It was really a life-altering kind of thing for me. And so I was fairly sure that the time I was starting my second year of medical school, I was going to do surgery. We did a lot of animal surgery. We did a lot of very avant-garde kinds of things. I worked with Dr. Eisman on, on liver perfusion, because Eisman had the crazy notion that someday we'd be able to do liver transplants if we could just preserve livers. You know, so we worked on these perfusion models with pigs, pig livers. Uh, some stuff that really, you know, in the UK was a very, very uh, uh, happening kind of place. Uh, one of the problems was it was hard to keep people here and and, uh, and whatnot. And I do, I do. I'll just tell one. One. This is an old man story. So, so anybody's heard too many old man stories, just can quit listening for a minute. But, but it is interesting how the world changes because Kentucky, when I was here as a resident, had a pyramid system, and Bill will remember. We, we went, there was like 18 of us trying to get in four spots. In the Vietnam War was going on. Nobody had a clue where any of us were going to be. Uh, you know, I joined the Kentucky Air National Guard, and people thought I was crazy. Because, you know, now that people act like that's some cowardly thing to do, boy, when you had a chance of being called up on a moment's notice, that was not regarded that way. I, so I did some jumping out of helicopters with live fire rounds and carrying 30-pound packs on your back. and. And also, so, you know, it wasn't 80 hour work week, and as Bill, okay, Bill and I were interns together, Dr. Walton, and so, uh, but I have a tremendous debt to UK. I'm still big blue all the way. I come to every basketball game if I can. I don't make as much football because I do horse stuff more in the, in the fall, but uh, I'm very indebted to UK and, and the friendships and things I've developed here. Uh, and if I can figure out how to make this work, I'll be good. Which one are you going to Just trying to, does this work? Advanced slides. Yeah, I'm just you so, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Which one are you using? Uh, the blue. Are we trained? So, uh, what I'm, I'm going to first talk, talk about Richard for a moment. Um, um, I'm going to talk about training, and I'll get on the end of this in, in, in a minute. But I want to talk about Richard for a minute. Richard was a was a great friend of mine. Uh, I remember. We did, a, we did a session at the college, sort of point counterpoint kind of deal. And I actually won the state debate championship when I was a senior in high school, so I could make an argument even when I was totally wrong, and, and, which is the mark of a good debater, but sometimes a dumbass. But, but anyway, <laughs> so Richard was talking about Oskies and, and all that kind of thing, you know, about the new, new way you, you, what would be the current way of doing stuff. And I said, no, no. My, my job was old school is the right school, and you know, you, you learn by seeing patients, and you can't ask somebody that's really sick. You know, you can't really, you can't get an actor to really portray somebody that's really sick. Somebody that's in shock and blood in your face, you, you can't ask you that. And so uh, it, was, it was a really good debate. It was sort of fun and, 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 and what not to do. And we talked a lot, I don't remember ever talking with Richard about a clinical problem. We talked a lot about training, training issues, medical students he was very interested in, resident training, something I've always been, been, been interested in, as was he. And we talked a lot about faith-based stuff, especially, 
I think maybe a little later in his life, and 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 I found his his move to, to that to to be very moving to me in, in terms of the way his life evolved and whatnot. So I think for the, the lesson I, I'd say for, for residents in that regard, academic surgery can be a royal pain. God bless. I mean, private practice, which is now dead, by the way, is <laughs> <laughs> get back to that. Uh, you know, every, everything, everything is tough. I mean, there's nothing easy in and whatnot, but as I point out to people, I got relatives who farm for a living. And Lord God, did you imagine getting up in your whole life? It depends on where it's going to rain or not. I mean, or to rain too much. So, so we still got it pretty good, and we, we need to remember that. But the other thing about about being a profession, you know, going on the internet, and googling stuff, you don't develop personal friendships by doing that. You and and so much of what makes life worthwhile are the relationships that you develop. And Bill and I were not the closest of friends, but his, his daughter went to our medical school, and, and I always enjoy chatting with him every time I see him. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I miss Richard, and, and I know you all, and you saw him every day, would as well. I, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be the president of college, really doesn't amount to much. I mean, you get to travel around, and you're sort of the face of the college, but, but I wanted to be the chair of the board of regents of the college where you really do more policy making kinds of things and can influence things. And I was interested in two things, and that I really, it's the only thing I've ever really wanted to do. I mean, the other stuff, you, 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 you hope it comes to you and, and you're blessed and honored when it does, but I really want to be chair of the regions. I was very interested in two things. One was access to, to, rural, to rural care for surgery, which I think is a huge, huge national problem. And the other is training in surgery, which I think is really flawed now and, and not what it once was and not really what it should be across the board. And I was very, very pleased in, in talking to your residents today that, and, and talking to Swish that, I mean, I think you do train residents to operate. And, and that's really, I mean, all this other competency stuff and all, I mean, what patients really want is they want somebody who can diagnose their problem. Truthfully, they don't even mind if you're mean to them. If, if you can really take care of it. Uh, now, uh, you ought not be mean to anybody. And I'm also amazed at how you can be so, people can be sort of incompetent if you're nice to people get away with it. But, <laughs> but, but we really do have a problem, I fear, in, in when 80% of people or 85% of people or 90% of people are doing fellowships and whatnot. So, so when you come to an academic medical center where everything's team-based and complex-based and care-based and and, and service line based and, and start saying things that might be offensive to, to people who have their own little niches. I realize that there are some hazards in doing that, but I won't do it anyway. So at any rate, so I worry about access to care. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about general, rural versus urban and suburban type <coughs> surgery. General surgery versus specialty type stuff. Uh, workforce wastage, which I don't hear anybody ever write about because it's hard to find data on, but I'm confident now is a huge problem uh, within surgery. Just wastage of people ruined their lives, ruined their careers by, by just a variety of things. And then a little bit I'm going to talk about provision of emergency care, uh, particularly in, in, in general surgery. So, you know, there's been a lot of stuff focused on, on lack of surgical coverage in rural America, but it's been my observation that, that there's an awful lot of places in both urban and, and suburban areas that, that really like surgical care as well. And, and or, or it's inappropriate surgical care, or, I mean, I don't mean that it's, that it's bad care, but, it, but it's, it's not delivered perhaps in, in, in the most timely kind of ways. I gave a talk, a similar kind of talk, in, in, in New York, and I had two or three people from, from Long Island, one from Staten Island, get up and say, this is a huge problem. Access to general surgical care is a huge problem in the metropolitan area of New York. Other than Manhattan, we have a real problem in, in general surgery care in, in New York. Gave a talk, a similar workforce kind of talk at, at the San Francisco Surgical, and the guy who was from UCSF said, well, you know, geez, this is, I mean, he, he was fairly critical of the talk, which is fine. And he was a pedobiliary guy who did basically one operation, which is liver resection, which is fine. And so, you know, if you're a one operation guy, I mean, that's certainly, well, it's okay, because you need those. And so, a, a tiny short woman about yay tall got up and, 
she was from Marin County across the, and she just chewed on him good. I, you know, about, you know, just come across the base, smart ass, she told him, said, you know, said, you'd see we have real needs there. So I guess my point is, uh, I think there's an awful lot of places that, uh, that need surgical care. And frankly, we have a shortage of general surgeons in Louisville now. And my definition of general surgery, probably just somebody that wants to or will take call, you know, if you think of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's talk about rural surgical care. According to census data, we've got about 46 million. You can, these numbers I've seen, 40 to 55, you know, you can get any kind of numbers you want. But the point is 15 to 18 percent of our population live in some kind of rural area. Uh, provision of medical care is an issue in all types. I mean, so this is not just a surgical issue. Primary care is a huge problem and, and whatnot. But lack of surgical care, and particularly in general surgery, I think is, is particularly acute. And, and I often say, you know, access to, I mean, you know, access, a lack of access to a primary care doctor will kill you slowly if you don't get your stuff. Access to surgical care can kill you pretty quick, you know, sometimes if your spleen's bleeding or, or this or that. I did a lot of work with the college with, with a guy named George Sheldon, who's now deceased, who was president of the college at one time. And there's a place called the Shep Center, which is at the University of North Carolina there in Chapel Hill. And so I worked with that group a fair bit in trying to look at, at different surgical workforce kind of, they, did, they had this technique I'll show you one in a minute, where they did this mapping of, of surgeons around. And, and George and his colleagues there came up with a phrase they called a surgical deserts, where there might be about 50 miles with a place where you didn't have coverage. I recently mm -hmm. talked to a guy named uh, 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 Pat Walker, who some of you may know, uh, who was on the board of surgery. Pat worked in a town called Crockett, Texas, in East Texas. And his hospital was closed about a couple months ago closed and he was it's a county of 35,000 was the only hospital there he was the only surgeon there of any type and now to get any type of surgical care in any direction from from Crockett Texas to the adjoining counties it's an hour and a half drive to any emergency room. and so that's a problem I don't care what what well you cut that 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 is a problem so so uh, there's a, this color-coded things that where uh, where you get uh, uh, map and I'll show you just in a minute but uh, so blue is is and there's shades of blue that don't really show up very well but dark blue is good uh, uh, in terms of, of relative population some of those you, you don't need many surgeons in high population areas white's bad so you see in, in Kentucky eastern Kentucky there's some spots of blue there although generally light shades of blue uh, and only only dark blue is robust. South Florida is pretty good. California, they got that pretty well covered. But some areas there that, that, that frankly need some help. And again, those light blue areas, uh, um, you know, that's not high density. These are high density. This is nothing. Of course, that's mostly desert. But you can see through here, lots of places, uh, very little, very little kind of care. A lot of white in, in Kentucky as well and as there is throughout mo much of the South. So I think there's a fundamental question about surgical workforces, how many general surgeons in particular are needed. And it's been said that you need about four and a half or so uh, for the minimum for 100,000 population. Uh, you can always argue, well, now colorectal and other people are specialists are taking over that and whatnot. How does regionalization Im impact the projected need and and whatnot. So the college did a, did a workforce study on, on urban, the average urban general surgeons 47, average rural general surgeons 59. I know a place in, in North Dakota where I, I visited with the chapter there where the only surgeon in a 200 mile area was 80 some years old, I think 84. And so, so North Dakota is actually beginning to hire people and farming them out for a couple of weeks at a time as faculty members doing doing really locum tenens, if you will, as faculty members and all. But there's been a net loss of rural surgeons annually for the past 20 years. And all. So, so I think it's, un, it's reasonable to say 
that we're really in a crisis mode for in many parts of, of, of rural America now. And, and the other problem, you say, well, regionalization, you know, well, we fix it. You know, roads are better, cars are faster, transport system better, it's all true. But what happens, I presume, you all get overwhelmed, right? I, I would, well, we do, we get just bombed. I mean, <coughs> by things that, that could be handled uh, 10 appendectomy weekends are not uncommon. And uh, that's just, that's, it's just as hard to manage all that in, in a center, in which, especially if you have a, a, a responsibility to do emergency trauma care, take care. We had six gunshot wounds on Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Um, you know, it's five of those interesting under 18 years of age, so. So I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough kind of deal. So let me talk for a minute a bit, a bit about specialty surgery. And so one of the things that, that when, when I was in college leadership, I, I tried to put together is try to get people from the so-called house of surgery to come and talk about their discipline, give us their opinions of, 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 of how their discipline was doing in terms of, of training of surgeons and access to care and, and issues regarded that way. So what we've got is we've got leaders of academic kinds of stuff, academies, RRC, specialty boards, and we usually had about three surgeons per specialty representing various entities within this group. And so the issues, as I say, were training and, and, and access, which were the two things that, that, uh, that I was interested in, and, and, and I got to drive the agenda. We've actually now had two of those kinds of meetings. So, so I'll give you a, a warning that I'll attempt to convey the general tone of these discussions. None of these were official policies like, well, you know, vascular believes this or, or orthopedics believes that. But, so in CT, what did you worry about? Well, so the training was increasingly long. Uh, there were some questions about how this direct match into CT is working. It's, it's going along, but nobody really knows quite yet. There's some concerns about, but not a but, but about the maturity of residents who are matching out of medical school. Many have never seen a heart operation, but they're now going into heart surgery. That seems a little weird. And so the transparency of outcomes uh, <coughs> creating problems. And you know, we, we, you know, what we know about accountability is the more accountability you have, the worse the outcomes are. In cardiac surgery, it's for sure, it's true. Because you're not gonna take it. I mean, if, you're, if your name's gonna be in the newspaper for having a bad outcome, the best way to avoid a bad outcome is let that patient sit over in the corner and die. That's the best way to do it. And truthfully, if that's what America wants, then sometimes America ought to get what they want. That sounds harsh, I'm sorry. But that's what's happened in cardiac surgery. Mortality in the places that are publicly reported, primarily Pennsylvania and New York, and had for, for heart disease has, has really gone up with public reporting as opposed to down. And that's, that's not operative. Operative mortality's done this, but total mortality's done that. And so that's not a good situation uh, and, and the cardiac worries about it. The job market for cardiac is, quote, not robust. Yeah, that's for damn sure. Uh, but people keep saying, well, as the population ages, surely one day we're gonna need more heart surgeons. We haven't seen that day yet. And until we get into more effective care and, and get away from putting stents in people, that, well, I'll do that. But at any rate, general thoracic job market's been pretty good. Access to care, they would argue, is reasonably good, and some would say too good that perhaps we have too many cardiac centers and, and, and whatnot. Orthopedics, training's thought to be good. They love their training. 95% of all people in orthopedics now do fellowship, 95%. In Louisville, there are no general orthopedists. There are none. I don't know if Lexington has them. There are none in Louisville. If your knee hurts, God bless you. You can't get in to see a rheumatologist. There are, there, they're fixed up, they're given they're given biologics and making a fortune doing that, so they sure don't need to worry about your knee. So if you and my late wife had a knee problem and I, I called one of my associates and and I couldn't ever get to talk to him and to see her, they said, Is she ready for a knee replacement? I said, I don't even know what's wrong with her knee, it just hurts. And I said, I'm sorry, but she's ready for a knee replacement, call and make an appointment. So so access to a major orthopedist is, is a concern. Uh, for the specialty. They worry about that. They don't know what to do about it because 95% of you know, shoulders, hips. I mean, you can't find a foot surgeon either, so it's not just, not just general. 
neurosurgery. Neurosurgery was the most satisfied of all. And they loved it. Well, they, they, they had everything fixed. So they have seven years, and one of those years is a transition to practice year uh, and, and whatnot. They did note, though, that their training is very, very different than spine. For example, most neurosurgery people spend a lot of time with the brain, if they can find brain cases, and, and do very, there's very few brain cases done in private practice. Do a lot of spine, do a lot of that kind of stuff, and, and very much less as a percentage in, in the training. But again, they were satisfied, but they were satisfied about everything. Ophthalmology, they thought their training was good, work becoming increasingly you know, specialized. They also were worried that they're just fewer general ophthalmologists because you know, retina guys and glaucoma guys and all. They said access is an issue, a big trend, trend toward big mega groups. Louisville certainly has that where there's only two or three groups of ophthalmologists and got about 20 of them in a the group. And they all do, do a bunch of different stuff. And they have few emergencies, so access is a bit of a lot of an issue with them. We actually have OB Gen as a part of the college, sort of, uh, and they really thought their training was awful. Uh, that's what the people say. That's two straight years of we're awful. We're, we don't know what we're doing. And so their problem is they don't know how to train for what the workplace now demands. So if you think about it, my daughter does OB Gen, and she does it all. I mean, she's she's old school. She she's really good with a laparoscope. She's I mean, watching her do a laparoscopic hysterectomy, I just, I mean, she's really slick. And she does like OB, she loves delivering babies, and, you know, she takes a call and does it all. But you now have laborists who only do, does anybody know what a laborist is, y'all? Yeah, you only have laborists. And so you have office OB gen who do only that. You have GYN only. You have GYN, obviously GYN oncology is a separate specialty area. But they only have like three, maternal, fetal, uh, infertility, and, and um, surgery. And I guess, I guess the, your GU, the neurodynamic part, I guess, is too. But, uh, you know, your old guy, high risk, fertility, and g one oncology, those are the four. So, so they're worried about how you train because very few people are now doing a broad scope of practice is, is what they're saying and whatnot. So does a laborist who does only delivery need training in office practice or anything else? No. I mean, uh, and again, access to care in many parts of the country is an issue. Urology, they said there was virtually no relationship to what they did in residency to what they did in practice. When you looked on their, their research exams. Pratt's office base, it's little this where they, and they did all kinds of stuff in training that they never were going to do, or very, very often didn't do afterwards. Access a huge issue, lack of hospital coverage. Louisville, private practice in Louisville, there's two groups. There's a huge urology group that has 50 some people in it. So it's a it's a, a corporation of its own. Nobody wants none of our you you're trying to get a urologist in our hospitals in Louisville, in any hospitals, really hard. Uh, they it's a it's they want to do outpatient stuff, they've got their own MRI, they've got their own uh, x-ray, they do their own radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's corporate medicine, that's like whatever you want to call it. And that's not unusual. Plastics, again, you know, preparedness issues and plastics, they worry about, uh, they worry about that everybody says they want to do reconstruction when they go in and then you, everybody comes out wanting to do an aesthetic stuff and, and the lack of reconstructive surgeons in the communities in many places is a huge problem they feel. ENT, same thing, disconnect between training and practice, little head and neck in practice. Usually, I mean, you know, you don't want to have a tongue jaw neck in your office when you're trying to do facial plastics and blepharoplasties and, and Botox and stuff, you know, and whatnot. Not enough ambulatory experience. They have very little concerns about access. Again, not as many emergencies. Pediatrics, lots of training concerns in pediatric surgery now, but on the length of training, uh, the perceived mandatory lab experience, you've got to be about 40 now to be a pediatric surgeon. Uh, and why they contend, I know we've got pediatric surgeons here, so I'll insult them and say, why you guys keep making people do two years of lab or, or thinking that they have to do that is beyond me. Too many pediatric surgeons for index cases, not enough exposure to common children's problems, uh, you know, and, 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 and 
whatnot. It was the pediatric concern. Colorectal, it was, well, we should be doing all the cases and general surgery shouldn't be doing any. So give us the cases and, and even though we don't have nearly enough people to do them, we'll eventually train them there. Yeah, yeah. Vascular surgery, they're still not unsure about how that bimodal entry is going to work. Uh, but general satisfaction with that 05 model. And all vascular surgery is a huge concern, uh, just like general surgeons. No, very few general surgeons do any vascular other than access anymore. And, and so lack of general or vascular coverage around the country, lack of general surgery is a huge problem. So you had many common themes. Everybody thought that duty hours need to be more flexible. Uh, I've, I've been leading a charge against the ACGMA, and I struck out pretty much on that. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get much traction with other groups. So orthopedics have got their own deals cut. A lot of deals that people have cut deals with ACGME to get a specialty certificate of their own without, you know, and so lots of stuff. But not enough real world or community experience and a major disconnect between training and practice was a common theme. Let me talk about workforce wastage for a minute. <clears throat> I got involved. So one of the things you think about, well, if somebody's not prepared to do general surgery, and, and that's where the need is, but, but they don't feel prepared. I talked to a program director yesterday in, in the East who told me that he didn't think any, any people were prepared to go into practice after five years of residency in general surgery. And I said, well, I think a lot of ours aren't. I said, I think I've seen a lot of people who are. He said, well, ours aren't. Okay, I feel well. Look at the mirror, but but that's a different different issue, and some of the people don't like to do that. Uh, so I started to think at the college, and I said I did sort of spearhead the thing, called the transition to practice program. We've now tried to change the name and market a little better. It's mastery of general surgery. I don't know if that's a good idea or bad, but one of the things that I've I've really had the opportunity over the last three or four years to talk to literally hundreds of people about their careers. I get phone calls emails, uh, I mean, some of them break your heart. Um, typical one this week. I had, um, I am a woman who trained in general surgery at a good place. I practiced for two years. I got pregnant. My baby had Downs. Uh, my situation is now stable, but I've been away from surgery for seven years. I'd like to do your transition to practice program and get Bread back up where I can go back into practice. Uh, that that I hear themes like that a lot. I hear the first job failure rate is incredibly high. Uh, I'm amazed at how many people who fail their first job. And if you fail your first job, if you're not careful, it can be a career ender for you. Ender, not a hindrance, an ender for you. Uh, and people fail because they often are unprepared for, for, because they simply don't know. We talked about this today, you know, in, in, in with the Chiefs. It's one thing to know how to put a stitch in, to confidently put a stitch in when somebody's standing watching you, even though they're not telling you what to do, because there's an assumption that if you're doing it wrong, somebody's going to yell at you or stop you, or, or you'll come to a hard stop. You know, stop. Um, and that's, a, I think, a valid assumption. It's different when there's nobody there to bring you to the hard stop. And so uh, Donald Rumsfeld, you know, was defense secretary, became very unpopular. But Rumsfeld said something about, said, what's the greatest danger in the world? You remember he was talking about Afghanistan and all this kind of stuff. said, the greatest danger in the world is to don't know when you don't know what you don't know. And if you think about it, as a sur the greatest danger to me as a surgeon is to don't know what you don't know. To not, and I didn't, yeah, that, that came out hillbilly, didn't it? But at any rate, uh, you know, and so, so I, I just really been worried. I've a whole bunch of pediatric surgery. I know half a dozen people are out there screwing around in the lab somewhere trying to get into pediatric surgery. You know, 35 years old, working in a lab for peanuts, trying to, trying to get into, oh, I, I'm going to follow my dream. Well, sometimes you, you need to get a job. And, and, <laughs> so, whatever. The other thing that I want to do is, 
provision of emergency care. And so people now have created this thing called acute care surgery. And it's interesting, acute care surgery. I wrote a whole bunch of papers about the need to do general surgery and have a broad-based practice. I thought that ought to be part of a, of, a, of a broader scope of practice, not a specialty in itself and, and whatnot. And so if you look at, it's amazing how much surgical care now around the country, especially for ED coverage, is, is done by various you know, things that would be called a care <coughs> surgery. And so I've interviewed a couple of people where both, both were women, whose husband somebody wanted at the university. One had done 12 cases in two years, and the other had done seven cases in 18 months. And the biggest case they'd done was a lap coli. There was one, one lap coli out of those 19 cases. One or two appendicitis, the rest with butt pus and drainage abscess, whatnot. So, so while acute care models provide ED coverage, they're certainly, in my view, not necessarily an effective and efficient use of workforce especially for hospitals that are working less than capacity, but who just are paying people a bunch of money to, to cover the ER. And will those surgeons then be satisfied long term with that as a career doing seven cases in 18 months? And what you also know is that your skill level can't possibly be right once you really need to take care of somebody who's sick or hurt and, and whatnot. And so the, the common model here is you work two weeks and you're off two weeks. And I don't think that works for skill maintenance for doing high-end stuff. Do you? Uh, surgeons? I mean, what do you think? I don't think so. Didn't, wouldn't have worked for me. And so, so, are we training surgeons the country needs? Hell no. Uh, not unless we're willing to accept a very different paradigm in terms of access, availability, and I would, I would posit likely quality as well. So, I think what we clearly need it's not an either or kind of thing. We need high-end specialists. We, we, need, we need spine surgeons. I've had, I've had, I can't tell you how many spine operations I've had, including fixing up some complications. I had 29 operations from, from June until Christmas in 2015, and, and I took plastic surgeons and spine surgeons and vascular surgeons and, and all kinds of people, or I wouldn't be here today. So we need, we need high-end kind of people. If you've got a Whipple, and, you know, I mean, it's a bad example, but, you know, I mean, if you need that, you, you, you need somebody good at doing that. That intricate case that you guys showed, I mean, you know, those are, those are hard operations. Judgments are hard. What you do is hard. And, and you also need people to advance knowledge. But what we clearly need are more general surgeons for access to care. We need people who can multitask, who have more than one, one you know, <coughs> bit of tools in, in, in their toolkit and who can handle a variety of surgical kinds of issues. And so with 80 plus percent doing fellowships, do, do we now have that? So it, it, I, what I've been trying to do is to determine, here's, here's what may piss people off in a minute. So is to determine the, the availability <coughs> for jobs after you do a fellowship. The residents, you know, junior residents ought to pay attention to that. I mean, the rest of you can blow off. You ought to pay attention to this, because I guarantee you this is true. Now, could I prove it's true? No, but do I know it's true? I do, and, and whatnot. And so it's my impression, and, and, and I'll tell you that, but I've done a lot of, lot of studying on it. So what I've done is listed it on a one to four scale, with four being needed and zero being not. Uh, job availability. Just, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about your ability to get a job doing that. All right? General surgery is four plus. Now, if you say, wait a minute, I got to stay in Lexington. I want to live on, I want to live over in that part of Lexington. I want to work at this hospital. Yeah, that may not. I don't know. You know, if you say, I want to, I want to, I want to go to Baptist Hospital. Little. That's where I want to work. It's the only place I want to work. Well, I don't know about that. It might not work. You want to go to a place where you're needed, and you don't have to go to Timbuktu. There's a general surgical practice in Fort Wayne, Indiana, second largest city in Indiana. 
uh, where the average, I think it's eight or nine general surgeons, and the average age of general surgeons is 66. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah. So they're now got acute care people in covering their ERs, and that's not working out real well. They're paying them a boatload of money that's about to bankrupt the hospital. I mean, it's crazy. The endocrine, I call 0 0.5. It's probably, that's high today. Right? Let me tell you. So, a couple years ago, we had a woman who left our practice and went to Yale. I guess the word got out. So, middle of June, uh, you know, end of the court, I had to call from a woman from Mayo Clinic, a woman from Cleveland Clinic, a day apart, wanting to know if we had a job. And I said, for when? They said, July. And I said, you mean two weeks from now? And they said, I said, you got a rich uncle or a, what is it? And I mean, I knew the answer. I was just being an asshole. But, but, but there are no, there are no, I mean, there, I don't even, we're now taking out all kinds of thyroids we don't need to take out in America. And I mean, there are people that image, uh, you know, they image thyroids and, and now, you, you know, if the image isn't so good, you can find any little thing. And oh, we better take it. And by the way, if you're going to operate on the thyroid, you're taking it all. Uh, but there's only so many thyroids you can take out, and then they're all gone. And, and all. <laughs> Vascular is four plus. Huge need for vascular surgery. Trauma, they ain't much, they're not academic trauma. Charlie's off, Charlie Harris is off interviewing there. He ain't been overwhelmed. There's no, there's not much in it. Academic trauma, acute care surgery, going to cover in the ER, doing seven cases a year, all kinds of that. You can get paid for it. And if that's what satisfies you, then, then that's good. But but academic trauma, we pretty well fill that 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 cup up pretty well. They say acute care surgery, good. Hepatobiliary, it sits about like it's about like endocrine. Now, can you build a practice slowly by doing other things? Sure, you might be. But again, think about how many people are fighting over that. Your transplant people want to do that now because there's, you know, they like to operate in the daytime every now and then. You got hepatobiliary biliary people, surgical oncology, you know, I mean, same kind of thing with the Whipple operation. Uh, colons, think about who all, I mean, how many people now fight for those? Colorectal surgeons, well, wait a minute, they may have a cancer, that's me. Well, I'm an acute care surgeon, they've got acute diabetic, I think I ought to do that. Well, I'm a general surgeon, I can do this. So, so a lot of it you fight over stuff. Colorectal, I think the job market's still pretty good. MIS, because it's really part of general surgery, is pretty good. The problem is that too many MIS people can operate. So, so Lumberton, North Carolina. Anybody know Lumberton? So, I get a call. They want to know if I could help them. So they had three guys that they'd hired to do general surgery. They were hospitalist surgeons. So a patient comes in with bowel obstruction. So the deal was going to be they were going to do the, the stuff, you know, <coughs> take care of what came in, and, and they had a couple go do some trauma, and, and then the, the, the other stuff would get farmed out to them, have some skills. Surgical oncology, we had a gal named Sandra Wong who trained with us, who's now the chair at Dartmouth, so she was our visiting uh, professor a couple of weeks ago. She, she, was, she, she had heard me give some variant of, of this. And she said, I didn't believe it, but she surgical oncology. She said, I didn't really believe it. She said, I advertised for a surgical oncology position. And guess how many applications she had? Want to guess, Dave? 46 in a week. In a week? In a week. She had only sent it out a week. During the Journal of Medicine, she had put one ad that hadn't even made it into the surgery wow. plan. I could hire 15, 16 surgical oncologists in June for 100 grand, and they'd be great to get the job. This is what it is. MD Anderson, last year, uh, we, we took one of our guys back. We repatriated one of them. He turned it with us. And he had seven of his colleagues who didn't have jobs in the middle of June. There's only, I mean, again, there's only so much of this stuff that, that you can do. Breast, still pretty good, but a lot of that's filling up pretty quick. It depends, you know, and, but it's becoming more and more of a special. So, nature abhors a vacuum. That's an Aristotle thing. Somebody's going to fill these roles. Osteopathic surgeons, for sure, I mean, you know, and that's fine. 
Family practice are now wanting to, to get back in the game, which is dangerous, I think. Uh, you know, cross-training for, for, quote, minor cases like cholecystectomies and appendectomies, by the way. So in a lot of mission creep from non-physician providers, uh, whatnot. So lest you think I'm exaggerating about family practice, cross-training family practice, general surgeons uh, could enhance health care in rural America. So this is the former AF, let me read this, American Association President so-and-so from Boise, Idaho says rural family physicians so-and-so should work together to coordinate and deliver care for the good and what we need are more ability to do surgical procedures in family practice. So, and, and I don't, that's, I mean, to me, if we're not meeting the need, then that's on us, you know. I, you know. So, I once believed, when I was in the RRC, I pushed hard to increase residency. There have been very few increases. We had, we'd been at 900 residency spots in general surgery for 15 years. It got us up to 1,100 and some within a year when I was vice chair, because I effectively just did that. And I thought that expanding general surgery residencies would, would, would work, that market forces would work. It was totally wrong. All it did is create more surgical oncologists and endocrine surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> and people, so why don't people want to do vascular surgery? Because it's hard. Ask Dr. Andy. It's hard. You work at night, you have to do shit. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the other thing that clearly won't work is appealing to our better nature. So, so I, now this will insult all the medical students since I've insulted everybody else, but so, I have all, all kinds of, I want to do international health someday. Okay, good, good, good on you. And I know we've got somebody who's going to do that. And he's very committed and very dedicated, and, and, and I know that's good. And so I, the question I always ask, and I said, would you go to Whitesburg? And they said, where's Whitesburg? I said, it's in eastern Kentucky. It's rural. It's poor. Would you go to Whitesburg? Or any place, you know. Crazy, out of your mind? Why would I do that? I can't talk about that at cocktail parties. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I now have two transition to practice spots that we've set up on, on in the Indian Health Service. I haven't got a taker yet. But to me, if you want to go help somebody, you know, help. I mean, we've we got lots of Americans who need help. And, and, and I, do, I do find that troubling. I mean, I, I, I just I find it fundamentally troubling in, in modern life. So, what I'm amazed at is that we haven't had more just pure political outcry kind of stuff uh, and all. I, when I was actually chair of the Regents, I, I got to, I got to Max Balkas, who was then senator from Montana, and, and he was very interested in this issue and trying to push legislation, and then President Obama appointed him to the ambassador of China, and, and there, that went out the window. Uh, GME funding is going to change, and I think it's going to change things in a major way. What, what's being proposed, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Washington, unfortunately. I mean, it's, and by the way, anybody thinks that Washington has a plan, they, they've got no, I mean, it's, they may have these vision kind of things, but it's sort of like visions, like, like crazy people get visions. I mean, it, there, there is, I mean, Washington has no plan. I mean, it, it really doesn't. And, that, and I mean, I do think on the payment models, they're trying to drive people to advance payment models or alternative payment. That, but that's, they have no idea how that would work. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds good. So the thought here, though, and this is not really CMS necessarily as much as, as Congress is, is sort of pushing, that right now if you look at the way that, that funding is done, residencies, fundings come through hospitals, not to institutions, not to universities. They come through the hospitals. And you then get a lot of indirect stuff that will fund a lot of water, water in Congress and, and in, the, in Washington are referred to as high-end, high-cost specialties. And all. So what they're wanting to do is, first of all, decrease general surgery for gen general funding by 30%. I don't know that that will happen. College is pushing hard back on that. But what they say will almost certainly happen, we'll see, it would be interesting to see is that the funding, make, even if it stays at 100% of where it is now, and that hasn't changed since 98, by the way. So, so even though we've added all these spots, 
Well, what, what everybody's been doing is these have been funded by hospitals or worse still in our case, we're now funding them out of the department. You talk about a way to bankrupt a department pretty quick. That's a way to do it. It's we, we just did stupid stuff in our department the way we did it. So what, what the plan is is to tie everything to a resident. You're going into general surgery. So we're going to trace you and follow your career and see if you do general surgery. You're going to go into primary care. So are you going to really go into primary care or not? Because if you're not, then we're going to hold institutions accountable by, by, by looking at, at, at linking funding to a resident <coughs> and their name. And then trace that. Because they're only interested in two things in Congress right now. Two types of providers. I hate to use providers, but that's what they talk about. What two, what two are they interested in? What do you think? I'll give you a clue. One's not surgery, one's surgery. Primary care. And general surgery. So if there's a need for vascular, they don't care. I mean, <coughs> right, I mean honestly, right now, they don't really care. So, interestingly, if you look at what, are the, what is the big cost driver in American health care now? Do you know? How much does, does surgery contribute as a percentage to, to overall health care in America, to health care costs? What do you think? 20%, 50%, 70%, 80%, 100%, 2%, 22%, that's a good specific guess. I like that. 15% or so? So, so where is health care going in America? What, what, what are the diseases that drive health care costs? Diabetes. What else? Heart failure. COPD. Obesity as a cause of type 2 diabetes. So, so the problem we have is that, and it's why you get, it's why, and, and the danger for surgeons are gonna be, and it's the only exception I'd, I'd make to the, to, to the previous talk about being in demand. Right now, if we do unnecessary cholecystectomies, and unnecessary, you can define it. I mean, we do, as a country, we do some, are clearly unnecessary. That actually, if they've got insurance, that makes the hospital money. Well, it does. In advanced payment models, it's not going to be linked to DRGs. It's going to be linked to CPT <coughs> codes. So CPT codes are going to be big, broad things like abdominal pain or, or whatever, or COP. So, so what you're going to be rewarded for is keeping patients out of the hospital. And then the danger is that surgeons are going to be cost centers, not profit centers. And we will be cost centers, for sure. And so, so we've got to make a case that we're doing what's right for America. And I don't think we could fully make that case now. I, I really don't. I, I, because you can't, you can't deny access to, to 40 some million Americans, or at least prompt access, or, I mean, without driving an hour and a half one way to get to an ER. Uh, for a possible surgical thing. So stuff's going to change. So I believe we've got problems with access to care in many areas and in several specialties. I think it's particularly acute in general surgery. I don't know how this is going to get solved. I mean, in a, in a free and open society where people can do what they want to do, I, I've seen no... And if you think about it, it's fellows are fellows, uh, you know, meaning hepatobiliary or transplant or whatever it is. There are no transplant jobs virtually. We trained, we hired back an, another transplant surgeon that we didn't need uh, because he's brilliant, great with his hands, 50 publications as a resident, smartest guy in the world, great with patients. He had one other interview other than us with that kind of record, 99 on his end training scores every year. And that was at, at, at UAB where he trained and they offered him sort of a junior faculty kind of super fellow kind of position at making about a hundred grand a year. So, so, I mean, that tells you a bit about that job market. So I, I think we, what, I think people in academics can't just keep, you, 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 you've got to, we, we 
have got to decide at some point in time that, that it can't be all about, about our institution when we have a responsibility that's going to be increasingly focused, I think, on us to do occasionally, at least on occasion, what's right for the country. I mean, every now and then, since the country is really paid for this, I mean, I mean, resident training is paid for by the country. And that's, that's funded. To, to, that's almost certainly at a 90% level that's how it's funded. And so we simply have to do a better job than we're doing in providing access and, and producing what the country needs. So with that, I'll stop and, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I always enjoy talking with residents and you've got a great group of chief residents and, and I really enjoy meeting them and, and, uh, and the case presentations were great. Those are good cases. Y'all did a wonderful job presenting them. So really appreciate being here and thank you very much.